Genius back with you once again, and I want to take you back in time just a little bit. I want to take you back uh, to the late 1970s, and I want to take you back to a magazine cover that came out at that time that was that turned out to be kind of iconic and kind of a part of pop culture uh, that has kind of transcended even the magazine that it was on. Uh, back, in, and this is something that if, if you're my age or older, I'm in my mid-30s, so if you're my age or older, you're going to remember this very quickly. Those of you who are younger than me, you might not remember this offhand, but you still have probably seen the magazine cover somewhere down the line. Uh, it was on a magazine called National Lampoon. Now, for our younger viewers here, you might recognize National Lampoon, that name uh, from some of the movies that they lent their name to, the Chevy Chase vacation movies and Animal House and that kind of thing. And, of course, they were very successful with that. But uh, where National Lampoon really made their name initially, was as a magazine back in the 1970s. They were a uh, kind of a humor and satire magazine, sort of a uh, highbrow version of Mad Magazine, if you want to think of it that way. And at that time, they came out with probably the most famous cover that they ever did. And on this cover was a cute little puppy dog, right in the center of the cover. Big puppy dog eyes looking right in the camera, right? And to the side of the puppy dog, you saw a man's hand and his arm coming into the picture and in the man's hand was a gun and so on the, on the cover the, the the man's hand and the gun were pointed right at the cute little puppy dog's head and the caption on the magazine cover said something like buy this magazine or we'll kill this dog okay it's pretty funny it was kind of controversial in some ways but everybody remembers that magazine cover if they've ever seen it and it, it kind of went on to become rather famous or infamous uh, in the history of National Lampoon magazine. Well, within the last couple of weeks, through all of this debt ceiling talk and the debate that's going on between the Republicans and the Democrats over it, and cutting spending versus raising taxes and that whole debate, I have often wondered if President Barack Obama has a framed copy of that magazine cover hanging in the Oval Office. Because much of the rhetoric that has come out of Obama and his minions and his, uh, and his people in the media certainly bears a striking resemblance to the caption on that magazine cover where they said, if you don't buy this magazine, we'll kill this dog. Well, Obama came right out and said that the Republicans are trying to hold a gun to the head of the American people through this debt ceiling debate. You know, I thought everybody was going to play nice after that Gabriel Giffords thing, huh? Well, you guys forgot about that quickly enough. But nevertheless, uh, Obama and his minions and his ilk and Democrats of all shapes and sizes have been pounding the pavement over the last couple of weeks, making the argument that if the Republicans cut fill in the blank with whatever program that they're talking about, if the Republicans cut whatever out of government, that some person somewhere will die or be denied education or not have any food or whatever. And it really, the approach that it comes off like a a bad imitation of a Sally Struthers commercial or a Jerry Lewis Labor Day telethon. Okay, I'm sorry. That, that was a little bit over the top. I, I don't mean to insult Sally Struthers and Jerry Lewis. I'm sure they do great work. But the government is certainly trying to, to take some of the thunder from them, if, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, the government has really uh, gone down the, the route, and the Democrats in particular, of, of playing the violin and trying to tug at the old heartstrings of the American people in an, ex, in an attempt to extort us uh, more than anything else. Now, Obama has been pounding the pavement and giving these type of speeches and making these comments for a couple of weeks. There was one press conference he had on June 29th that, that really illustrated this probably better than, than any of the other, uh, other appearances he's had. I want to quote from that just a little bit. Obama said in this June 29th press conference, and I quote, if we do not have revenues, that means there are a bunch of kids out there who do not have college scholarships. It might compromise the National Weather Services. It means we might not be funding critical medical research. It means food inspection might be compromised. I've said to Republican leaders, you go talk to your constituents and ask them, are you willing to compromise your kids' safety so some corporate jet owner can get a tax break? Now, the use of the word tax break kind of pisses me off on another level. We'll talk about that later. But you understand and you get the point from that uh, little blurb from our alleged president that they are really going down the road of 
Well, the, the Republicans are the ones that are trying to, to keep people from getting a college education and, and keep medical research from happening, etc., etc., etc. And he's making the case that we have a revenue problem in this country and that that's uh, the big issue that's facing us in this debt ceiling. Well, that's where I disagree. That's where a lot of, of conservatives disagree. I believe that we do not have a revenue problem in this nation. In fact, if any of you or if I, if any of us look at our, our pay stubs at the end of a week, we can pretty well tell you that there is not a revenue problem in the American government and the federal government. They're getting plenty of revenue out of us. Thank you very much. What we have is a spending problem and more to the point, a government problem. We have too much spending and we have too much government. Now go back to that little blurb that I quoted from Obama, which he's uh, kind of reiterated in all of his other uh, speeches and, and appearances since that time. What he was saying, talking about, you know, the, the, the government it, it cuts would, would deny people a college education and deny college scholarships and medical research and the National Weather Service and others, you know, other Democrats have talked about, you know, the evils of Republicans trying to cut Medicare and Social Security and there was commercials out with, you know, uh, an alleged Republican shoving grandma off a cliff somewhere. They've done all kinds of things uh, to reiterate that point. But all of those statements rely on one very large and very faulty assumption. That assumption being that the government is a necessary entity to facilitate any of those actions or any of those outcomes that they are talking about. In other words, they're making the case that if the government does not provide college scholarships, then nobody will. Or they're making the case that if the government does not provide medical research, then nobody else will. Or if the government doesn't provide a National Weather Service or Social Security or whatever other area you were talking about, that if the government does not provide that, nobody else can. And that is where, in the majority of cases, the Democrats are flat out wrong. You know, let's think about this a little bit. If you go through every single thing that the government is, is involved in and that they have a piece of and that they uh, provide a quote-unquote service for or that they have some oversight over, how many of those things truly could only be done by government? How many of those things are also done by the private sector or could be done by the private, by the private sector or could be done by ourselves individually? I would argue that a great many, a great majority of the things that the government are involved in are things that we could do ourselves or that the private sector could easily handle. And if that is the case, when we look at a situation where we are in debt up to our eyeballs, and frankly we do not have the money to keep spending on these bogus things that the Democrats are trying to spend them on, when we're in that situation, then it strikes me that if there's something the government's doing that could be done elsewhere, that maybe the government should get out of that business. You see, the assumption that the Democrats are making when they say that we have a revenue problem is they are making the assumption that the current level of government we have, the, cover, the current amount of government involvement we have, is a positive thing. And that in order to maintain that, we would need to raise more revenue. Well, if you were, if, if you were of the opinion that we need to maintain the current size of government or increase it, then yes, you would have to increase revenue. However, many of us, myself included, do not believe that we need to maintain the current size of government. We believe we need to reduce the size of government. And if you drastically reduce the size of government, then you do not need that revenue. I don't want to maintain the government that we have right now. Now let's look at a couple of examples. Let's look at a couple of situations where uh, Obama himself or other Democrats have uh, have accused us of cutting something or wanting to cut something that is vital to the American people. In Obama's little blurb there, he talked about, as he called it, the National Weather Services. It's actually called the National Weather Service, but let's not get nit nitpicky about it. Let us ask the question in this forum. Do we, the American people, really need the government to maintain the National Weather Service? Now, I'm asking that question right now, and I'm sure a number of you who are watching this are jumping up and down and saying, are you crazy? Do you remember the tornadoes out in Alabama or the, the big tornado that hit Joplin, Missouri, which is just a few hours away from where I'm at? Or even 
you know, I, I'm not here in the St. Louis, Missouri metro area. Just a stone's throw from where we take this is where a big F4 tornado hit back in uh, on Good Friday. So a lot of you are, are saying, in the face of all those storms, of course we need a National Weather Service. Are you nuts? No, I don't believe that we need a National Weather Service. And no, I'm not nuts. Let me explain why. Out here in the Midwest, and, and, and in a lot of other places as well, I would, I would believe, in 2011, in this day and age, most television stations have Doppler radar, they have forecasting tools, they have at least one meteorologist on duty. Many of them have more than that. They almost, a lot of them, or almost all of them around here anyway, cut into local programming very quickly when there's even the threat of severe weather or storms or that kind of thing. So it strikes me that most of the television stations and radio stations and there's even tools out on the internet that, that can do the same thing. They can provide the information to us, the same information that the National Weather Service provides as quickly or even more quickly. In fact, uh, I've seen many cases where you know the, the local TV station cuts into programming and they bring up the Doppler radar and they and I mean these things are amazing these days. They can show you practically down to the neighborhood where a storm is at and where it's heading and when it'll be there. It's amazing what what this technology can do, and almost all the television stations have it nowadays. And I've seen them uh, break into programming and bring that radar up and say, hey, here's a storm over in this area. It's moving this direction, and it has not had a, a National Weather Service warning issued for it yet, but we believe that it will within two or three minutes. And then a couple minutes later, what happens? Here comes the blurb from the National Weather Service indicating that there's a severe thunderstorm warning, tornado warning, etc. So, when that happens, it makes me think, wait a second, is, is what the National Weather Service just did, is what they provided, is, is that redundant? Did we really need them to be involved in the process? No, the television station was able to do it based on the, the equipment that they have and the capabilities that they have. And there's similar uh, redundant sort of capabilities and, and equipment in several other areas of the private sector. Frankly, the government does not need to be involved in that. Now, there might have been a time 20, 30, 40 years ago where a National Weather Service might have fulfilled a need because maybe uh, at that time the private sector or the TV stations did not have that advanced equipment. But now they have equipment and knowledge and manpower that, that is as good as or better than the National Weather Service. So I think we can relook at it and say, hey, maybe we really don't need that anymore. Maybe that's an area we can cut. Let's think of another example in another area. And this one, if the National Weather Service example pissed you off, this one's really going to make you jump off the ledge. What about Social Security? Do we really need the government to facilitate the Social Security program? Now, I would argue the answer to that is a pretty clear no. When, and again, I know some of you are screaming at me, but hear me out. For most of our history in this nation, we did not have a Social Security program. Now, those who are in favor of Social Security or, or get angered when Republicans try to even look cross-eyed at Social Security, much less make a cut to it, they'll tell you that, well, if we, if we get rid of Social Security or if we even cut it, then you know, some old person somewhere is not going to get uh, taken care of or they're going to die in the streets or whatever other horrible tale they can concoct. But is that really the case? Well, as I said earlier, for most of our history, we did not have a Social Security program. And, and did that happen? Did we really have old people dying in the streets and pestilence everywhere? No, we didn't have any of that. Old folks were taken care of by their families, or if there wasn't a family around, they were taken care of by the, the faith-based community or their churches, taken care of by the charitable community, the philanthropic community. So you see, there is and there are areas of society that can come up and, and take care of these situations if the government backs out. There are methods in place, there are infrastructure in place that can take care of all of these things. The government does not need to be involved. In the terms of Social Security, we were getting along fine in terms of, of how we treated our older folks before Social Security came about, so ask yourself a question. What happened in the early 20th century that necessitated Social Security coming about? Because people prior to that had set aside money for themselves or depended on their families or whatever. What changed to necessitate the government taking over that role? Nothing. Nothing. 
nothing changed. There was no reason for the government to come in and say, hey, we need to take some of your money and set it aside for you when you hit retirement. Why do I need the government to do that? Can I not do that on my own? Do I not already do that on my own? Most of us do that every week on our paychecks. We set a little bit aside on a you know, 401k pension or just in a savings account or however you want to do it. Most of us are already doing that. Heck, I'm in my mid-30s. I'm assuming that I'm not going to see a dime of Social Security. Yet I get robbed at gunpoint to take the money from me. So do we really need the government to be involved in Social Security? No, I don't believe we do. I think we need to look at phasing that program out. And that's even something that most Republicans won't even talk about. Now, don't get me wrong. We certainly need to make sure that we have a way of taking care of those who have already paid into the system for 30 or 40 or 50 years through no choice of their own. They've been forced, to, they've been forced into this Ponzi scheme. Yes, you've got to take care of them. But for the generations that come after them, including myself, we need to dump the damn thing. Get rid of it. It's an area where government has failed. So there are just two, a myriad of examples we can talk about where government involvement has been more harmful than it has been effective. And where certainly there are apparatuses other than the government that can take care of the programs that the government is currently involved in. So it's time to ask the question with every single program where there's government involvement, from small things like the National Weather Service to bigger things like Social Security, Medicare, the EPA, any number of things you want to mention. It's time for us to ask one simple question. Is it absolutely necessary for the government to undertake this task? And if the answer is anything other than yes, then we need to cut that program. We need a drastic cut, not only of spending in this nation, but we need a drastic cut in government. And when we get that, even though it's going to take a long time to get there and we're going to, have to get a lot of politicians to see the light, but I think the American people are starting to see it, once we get to that point, then it will prove that we no longer need that huge revenue stream. We no longer will need increases in revenue to fund the government. The government's already too big and it's already too ineffective. Now, before we go this week, I want to mention one other, one other thing about uh, the rhetoric that's come out of Washington, out of Obama, out of the Democrats. You heard me briefly refer to it in that blurb that we talked about at the top of the show, where Obama used the word tax breaks. I do not believe that that is by accident. He used it in that speech, and he's used it time and again, just about every time he's opened his mouth the last couple of weeks. He's argued that the, the Republicans are wanting to protect corporate jet owners and hedge fund managers and, and keep their tax breaks in, in, in line while the poor man gets screwed. That's essentially the narrative they're giving him. However, I think they're being very intentional in using the word tax breaks. And I think they're, they're trying to use it to create a very false impression and a very false set of facts. You see, when you hear the word tax breaks, what's the first thing you think of? Well, if you're like me, you hear the word tax breaks, you think, okay, someone is being allowed to shirk their level of responsibility or, or to get away from their responsibility or somehow to not, uh, to not hold up their end of the bargain of upholding society. But is that really the case with the wealthy? Are they really getting tax breaks in that sense, in the sense that the tax breaks that they have enable them to not contribute to society at a level, uh, at a level of fairness? I don't believe so. Remember, we have a progressive tax rate in this country. And anytime you have a progressive tax rate, you have an inherently unfair system because the wealthy are being forced to pay more than their fair share of taxes. And so if you want to look at the Bush tax cuts, for example, that's the, the most vilified example of these things. You want to look at the Bush tax cuts, you'll see that, yes, they did lower the tax rate for the wealthy, but that tax rate is still higher than everybody else. So while they did get a tax cut, not a tax break, a tax cut, they are still paying an unfairly high amount, an unhighly fair proportion of taxes compared to the rest of us. So therefore, they are not receiving a tax break at all. The function of the Bush tax cuts really just moved the wealthy closer to a fair tax rate, but it certainly didn't make that tax rate fair. It's still heavily unfavorable to the wealthy. So as long as you have 
a progressive tax rate, which we have in this country, then by definition, there is no such thing as tax breaks to the wealthy. They're always paying an unfair amount. So I would go so far as to say this. During our lifetimes, no wealthy person has ever received a tax break. Simply has not existed. Now, people talk about loopholes and closing those things. You know what? I don't have a problem with closing tax loopholes, but I don't think that you only do that on the wealthy. If you're going to close them, close them with everybody. Truthfully, what you need is a consumption-based flat tax where there all are no loopholes, where there are no exceptions. Everybody goes to the same formula. Now, that I would be in favor of. But if you're going to have this ridiculous progressive tax rate, and if you're having, going to have the government interfering and creating loopholes, remember, the government created all of those loopholes. They create those loopholes in order to get corporations or people to do whatever they want, then you're inherently in an unfair system. And it's not a situation where the wealthy, by getting these tax cuts, are somehow shirking their responsibility. They're still taking on more responsibility than everybody else in terms of how our, our nation is funded. If you want to know who's actually getting tax breaks in this nation, it is the poor that are getting the tax breaks. They are the ones collecting the welfare, taking advantage of all the government programs, and the vast majority of them are not paying any income tax in. They are the freeloaders in this society. They are the ones who are not taking their responsibility in hand. They are the ones who are getting the tax breaks. And if you want to know who is unfairly benefiting from our tax code, it is the poor! Now, I know a lot of Republicans won't come out and say that. They'll beat around the bush. They'll talk about it without talking about it. But I'll tell you flat out. The poor are the open mouths that are being fed through our effort and our labor and not through their own. They are the freeloaders of society. You want to correct society and you want to get us on the right track, that's where you have to make the changes. So make no mistake, no wealthy person has ever received a tax break in our lifetime. And anybody who tells you that the wealthy or the cor corporate jet owners or the hedge fund managers, that they're receiving some sort of undue tax break, they are a liar. They're lying to you, flat out. And that goes up to and including the president. Make no mistake, when President Obama tells you that the wealthy are getting tax breaks, that statement is a lie. And that means that your president is nothing more than a dirty, filthy, lying son of a bitch. He's lying to you. There are no such things as tax breaks for the wealthy. We do not have a revenue problem in this country, and we do not have a wealthy class that are shirking their responsibility for upholding financially our society. They're doing more than their fair share. We do not need to raise revenue. We need to cut spending, and more importantly, we need to cut government. If we don't do it, then it won't really matter what party's in charge. It won't matter if it's conservatism or liberalism that's in charge. We will go off the financial cliff, period. There's your food for thought for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you again next week.